So today I'm going to be doing the second part of Philippians chapter 3. Last week I spoke from uh, chapter 3 verses 1 to 9, so I'm going to complete the chapter today. I'm going to be doing from 10 to 21. And the Apostle Paul writes as follows. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Last Sunday, uh, during the meeting here down at town center, Jen Swallow was leading the worship, and we sang a song which is called Forever. Some of the words go, the moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. But death, where is your sting? Our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. And then there's a refrain. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lord, the lamb has overcome. And as we were singing it last week, I had a sudden overwhelming sense that it wasn't just us singing in that auditorium but that we were joining in with heaven. I had a deep sense that hallelujah was being sung there too. And we know it is because we can read about it in the book of Revelation. And it was thrilling because I realized afresh that that is where we are heading. That we were joining the company of heaven and that's where we're heading. And the apostle Paul writes in verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. If that's true, then it must mean that we're temporary residents here. Classically, it's said that there are two things that you can't avoid in life, death and taxes. Even if you could avoid taxes, you can't avoid death. So if it's true that our citizenship is in heaven, then how should we live on earth? And Jesus talks about storing up treasure in heaven. He says, for where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. So I ask myself the question, where is my heart? Am I so caught up with what's going on here and now that I don't think about where I'm heading? Or do I think, well, I'm saved and Jesus will make sure I get to heaven so I don't need to do anything? Well, certainly not what Paul is saying here. In verse 10 and 11, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul is not talking here about earning salvation. No, he clearly says elsewhere in the first part of that chapter that it's through faith in Christ. That's how our salvation comes. But what he is talking about is, he's talking about both a now and not yet experience of the resurrection power of Christ. The present experience of it, but there's a future reality to take hold of too. And he certainly know what it is to suffer for Christ, to share in Christ's sufferings. And he talks a lot about that 
Elsewhere in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he lists some of the things that he's been through. Five times he says, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. All for the sake of the gospel. He considers it all worthwhile. Why? In order to know Christ better. Now, you may not have suffered, and I certainly haven't suffered as Paul has suffered for the sake of the gospel. In fact, in our country, actually, we have it pretty easy. We may have experienced some things at work or in our family where people have criticized us or made fun of us or scorned us or things like that. But in other parts of the world, Christians suffer a lot more than we do. But nevertheless, there's a dying to self that must take place as we follow Jesus. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So without death... There can be no resurrection. Without that sense of dying to self as well. How do we do that? Well, we can say, I'm going to die to self today. So you grit your teeth and you focus on dying to self. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a place for determination in dying to self. But Paul here wants us to focus on Christ. Why? To get to know him. To appreciate him. To thank him. To be energized by him. To be transformed by him. We all with unveiled face. As we draw near to Christ. As we get to know him. There's something that happens deep within us. There's a transforming power of the Holy Spirit that is at work within us. So to get to know him is Paul's focus here. And we need the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit within us. In order to get to know him. In order to die to self. Again, it doesn't mean that we let go and let God do everything. No. We have our part to play. Yes, we need the power of the Spirit. Yes, we need to experience something of that resurrection power of Christ. But that doesn't mean to say that we do nothing. And that's not what Paul is advocating here. It's a bit like if you come out for prayer... Uh, perhaps you would like to speak in tongues that heavenly language that the Holy Spirit gives and we pray for you or someone prays for you and you are standing there actually you have to do something it will be your vocal cords that vibrate it will be your tongue that moves it will be your breath that is functioning sometimes we experience that when we pray for people to speak in tongues they just expect God to do everything and so somehow take over totally no, no, no we're involved And we're involved too in this whole business of getting to know Christ. And in verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained all this. In other words, that experience of the resurrection power of Christ. Or have already arrived at my goal of experiencing the resurrection power of Christ. This is the not yet aspect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. The Apostle Paul's goal is to know Christ. Now Christ met Paul, we can read in Acts, on the Damascus Road. Paul was on a journey to persecute the Christians when he had a vision of Christ. And Christ met him and Christ said, why are you persecuting me? And as a result of that encounter that Paul had at that time, his life was totally transformed. I want to ask you this question. Where did Jesus encounter you? Now, our encounter may not have been as dramatic as Paul's. For some of you here, probably for most of you, it would have been the light, like the light of dawn. A gradual understanding of who Christ is and what he was requiring of you. For others, maybe fewer of us, it was like the light being switched on in a darkened room. Perhaps I could just do a straw poll now. Whose was a gradual dawning as to who Christ is? Just raise your hand. If it was a gradual sense of understanding, who is more a kind of light switched on moment? Yeah, okay, interesting, more than I thought. Okay. But the point is that Christ Jesus, as Paul says, took hold of me. Here's another question for you. Do you sense that? Christ Jesus took hold of me. In verse 13 and 14, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, all that God has for me, all that resurrection power. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, 
and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul here, he's using the image of an athlete running a race. Except in this case, the prize is to know Christ all the more until that day when we see him face to face. As I was studying to speak on this, I read this sentence which really got me, really got me thinking. And it's this, we must now become what we are. We must now become what we are. What does that mean? What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. When you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, one of the things the Bible teaches us is this. You're a new creation. Is that true? Am I, am I quoting the Bible correctly here? If anyone is in Christ, they are a what? A new creation. So if you're in Christ, you're a what? So you can say, I'm a new creation. And that, is that true as us as Christians? Yes, I'm a new creation. Another thing the Bible teaches us, and you read about it in the first chapter of John, is you're a child of God, born not of the will of man, but born of the will of God. You become a child of God when you come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Is that true? So you're a child of God, true? I'm a child of God, let's say that. I'm a child of God. So not only are you a child of God, but you're a new creation, true? Yes. And Paul tells us here that we're a citizen of heaven. Is that true? Yeah, he says our citizenship is in heaven. So if our citizenship is in heaven, then I'm a citizen of heaven. How about you? Yeah. So you're a new creation, true? You're a child of God, true? You're a citizen of heaven, true? Yes. You have a new purpose in life, true? God opens our eyes to his purposes, So I have a new purpose in life. How about you? I have a new, let's say it, I have a new purpose in life. So here you are, you're a new creation, true? You're a child of God, true? You have a new purpose in life? You're a citizen of heaven? We must now become what we are. We must now become what we are. If you know you're going abroad on holiday, you tend to get ready, don't you? Or I do, anyway. Check, I like to be organized. I hate to be disorganized if I'm going to hold it. I do a list, generally. I type out a list on the computer. I start at the soles of my feet, and I work my way upwards as to what I need. And at once when I failed to do that, and I got to where it was we were going, I said to my wife, Joy, I said, I didn't bring any underwear. <laughs> now, for a day or two, perhaps, but for a fortnight... So I had to go out and buy some. So normally, if you know you're going on holiday, you get organized. Depending on where you're going and what you're going to do. So if you're going skiing, then you pack appropriately for skiing. If you're going on a beach holiday, you pack appropriately for a beach holiday. Or if you're going for an interview for a job. It's a bare minimum, I would suggest. You at least think a little bit more carefully of what you're going to wear for the interview. You get ready. If you're really on top of your game, you would research the company, whoever it was, on the internet and find out what the requirements were. You might speak to someone in that industry. The point is this, you would get ready. You would do something about it. And Paul is saying here that Christ has done certain things and we must become who we are. And there are things that we need to do to press on to know him. He says in verse 13, forgetting what is behind. What does he mean by that? Does he mean you just don't remember anything of the past? No, he doesn't mean that because elsewhere it tells us about bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So what's he talking about when he's saying forgetting what is mine? And and to be fair, he also remembers something of his life because elsewhere he talks about his former life and he says, I'm the least of the apostles because of all the things that I did. So what's he meaning here when he's saying forgetting what is behind? Well, he's meaning this, don't be paralyzed by memories of past failures. Don't be paralyzed by memories of past failures. Now, I guess if we look back into our past, we can all remember our failures if we want to. We've all failed, true? Yeah. But don't be paralyzed by that. Don't let your memories of past failures prevent you from pressing on to know Christ. On the other hand as well, and don't also look back on the past 
the golden past nostalgically. So that, oh, in the good old days. They did that in the Old Testament. When the, the, temp, the, the temple was being rebuilt, they said, oh, it's not the same as it was. It's not the same as it was. Instead of appreciating the new thing that God was doing. And so, neither our failures of the past should prevent us from pressing on to know Christ. In fact, God says, as far as the east is the west, I've taken your sins from you. And I will remember them no more. So forgetting what is behind, Paul says, he presses on. Why did God take hold of me is a question I've been asking. Why did God take hold of you? Paul talks about here, about Christ taking hold of him. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why has God taken hold of me? Is he simply looking for an obedient human robot? And seriously, I've asked myself that question in the last year. Is that what the Lord is looking for from me? To just be an obedient human robot. So that when he says jump, I jump. When he says sit, I sit. When he says speak, I speak. Is that what God is looking for? I don't think so. The answer is in what God did in the beginning and what he will do in the end. In the beginning, what did he do? He made people to be in relationship with him. And at the end in the book of Revelation, one of the things he says is, my servants will see me face to face. And God created us to be in relationship with him. Not because he needed us, but I, bet, I guess that because he was so full of love that he chose to share it in the most costly way possible. Because it reveals who he really is. So God wants us to get to know him more and more and more and more. There's another song that I love, which we're going to sing, I think, afterwards. And it's the song, Good, Good Father. Such a simple song. And uh, I just love it. And one of the lines is, and you call me deeper still. And you call me deeper still. And you call me deeper still into love, love, love. And that's what God is calling us into. He's calling us into getting to know him more and more. You see, how much we give ourselves to God will depend on how we see him. Let me say that again. How much we give ourselves to God will depend on how we see him. How do you see God? What's he like? I sometimes ask myself that question and I reflect about how I see God. And I think, do I sometimes see him like an Ofsted inspector? A school inspector. He comes into the room, as it were, with his clipboard. And he assesses my performance. And it's a bit stressful. And it's quite demanding. Because the standards are so incredibly high. And I find, actually, that most of the time, I can't meet those standards. I'm failing. And therefore, I live under a cloud of uh, failure. A sense of failure. And actually, if I see God as some kind of Ofsted inspector whose standards are so high that I can rarely attain to them, then actually I'm not really going to want to get to know that person any more than I already do. In fact, what I would probably do is shrink a bit away from that person. So this is so important how we see God. Because how we see God will affect how we reflect him to the world. If we see him as harsh and judgmental, then that is how we will reflect him to the world. And you see that in the Christian world. You see that when people are protesting against things like abortion. Maybe not so much in this country. But you see it in some countries where people, so-called Christians, are so vitriolic. And seem to be so full of anger. uh, That you think, is this really what Christianity is about? But actually of Jesus it says he was filled with two things. You remember what they are? John's Gospel, chapter 1. Grace and truth. He was filled with grace and truth. Remember the time when the woman was caught in adultery and she was thrown before Jesus in order to test him. They wanted her stoned. But Jesus showed her what? Grace and truth. Showed her grace and truth. He said, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. It wasn't either or. It wasn't just truth. It was grace as well. How we see God will affect how we reflect him to the world. Last week, I talked about how we can get to know Christ. So I don't want to go over those points. But I want to add something based on what Paul writes here in verse 17. Paul says in verse 17, Join together in following my example 
brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So Paul here is talking about another way in which we can get to know Christ more. And it's this, it's through the example of others. By looking at the qualities that we see in other Christians' lives here in the church. And speaking personally about you, many of you here today, whom I have known for a number of years, and you're sitting here right now, I don't want to point you out because I don't want to embarrass you, you have reflected Jesus to me many times throughout my Christian life. I have seen Jesus' compassion through you. I have seen Jesus' encouragement through you. I have heard Jesus' wisdom through you. I have experienced Jesus' love. I have seen your interest in others, which has inspired me too. And I have seen your faithful service to the Lord and the community of his people. That's another way in which we can get to know Christ. Paul says, now, follow, follow our example. And I was look at those who are modeling something that is worth following. They're embodying something of who Christ is, something of his qualities. Look at that, because that also provides a model in which we can get to know him. And we can never get to the end of getting to know who God is. There's that wonderful picture in the book of Ezekiel where Ezekiel sees the river flowing from the throne of God, and it's a river of life. So it's a metaphoric picture of the river of life flowing from the throne of God. And you may well be familiar with the story how Ezekiel goes into the river. And the first time he goes into the river, he only goes ankle deep. And then he goes further down the river and he goes knee deep. And he goes further down the river and further down the river until he can't even stand up in the river. He has to swim. Such is God's love. And we see it in the creation as well, don't we? We see something of God's hidden depths. Scientists researching the human genome, the genetic code, and all that stuff. And they get very excited. We've, we've discovered this about the human genetic code. And then they find, actually, they've discovered that. But there's another mystery that unfolds as a result of that discovery. And it's the same when we look into space, isn't it? We send our rockets up, and we have our telescopes up there, and we find very exciting and thrilling things. But it always opens up something else to get to know. Some of the mystery that we would like to be explained. How much more? Have you ever considered this? How deep, how wide, how intense is God's love? How wide is God's love? How deep is his love? How profound is his love? How much of God's love is there to get to know? This is what Paul is pressing into. He's pressing in, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Do you know, we've recently... Uh, become grandparents again and again and again. In the last six months, we've had three grandchildren. And uh, sometimes I think, how am I going to cope with loving them all? There's six now, plus husbands and wives. and So it's all, you know, in progressing. How how am I going to be able to love them? Does it mean I love one more than the other? Or, Or what's it going to be like? Well, this is what I've found. I found this, that my love grows. My love gets bigger. It gets bigger in order to encompass them all. Now, we are made in the image of God, correct? So if our love somehow can grow, I don't know, God's love has got to be profounder than mine. It's got to be deeper. It's got to be wider. It's got to be higher. And actually, the, the thing about God's love is it's never ending. We're never, ever going to be able to fathom the height, the length, the breadth, the width, the depth of his love. And it's thrilling when when the Lord illuminates something of his love to us. And we see it, of course, personified in his beloved son, Christ. We see it personified in his beloved son when he gives his life to each one of us. And we're never, ever going to come to the end of knowing who he is. Isn't that a thrill? Isn't that wonderful? Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we're heading. We need to have our eyes opened to see there's more and more. We need to have a better, or I do, understanding of God's love for me. That's why I love that song. You're a good, good father. Because it proclaims the truth. And I'm loved by you. It's simple. But it's true. You are a good, good father. That's who you are. And I am loved by you. 
And when I understand that, when I have a sense of the truth of that, then I want to get to know that person. I want to get to know him because he's good. And actually, when I look back on my life, and I'll talk about that this evening, if you happen to be here at the encounter evening, um, when I look back on my life, I can see so much of God's love and care and blessing, and I'm sure you can too. Can I just say something now to Mark and all the musicians and the worship leaders here uh, today? Could I ask you to stand up if you're involved in that? If you're if you're in, in the world, they've all gone to the cafe, have they? No, they haven't. Okay, right. So you're singing, singer, worship, you're involved in that. Please, thank you so much for all you do. Should, you know, you like to clap them. No, wait, I haven't finished. I haven't finished. <laughs> do you know, the worship of the Lord will continue forever. And last week I had a profound sense that we were joining in with what heaven was doing. And what you do is more than just, and you know this, I know. uh, It's more than just playing musical instruments. You know all that. But I'll tell you what I I feel it is. It's, It's pulling back the veil for us. When you play, when you lead us in worship, you pull back the veil so that we can see something of the splendor and the glory and the wonder and the beauty and the majesty and the presence of Almighty God, which encourages us, and we need that desperately. So I want to encourage you to play with all the skill that God has given you. I want you to play with all the enthusiasm that God has given you. I don't want you to hold back. I want you to give it your all so that by the time you've finished and come off the stage, you're not only energized, but you're exhausted. <laughs> Bless you. Please be sitting there, sit down. And I also want to say as well, please, that us as preachers, now there aren't, that, there aren't so many of us, stand up the preachers, those who stand up here on a Sunday morning, just that would be, is it? <laughs> that would be today. Uh, I just, yeah, you know, please can you encourage us to be as skillful as we can, to be as loving as we can, to be as challenging as we can, to be as anointed as we can, so that we too leave the stage energized and exhausted. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because what we're seeking to do above everything else is to encourage you in your faith. We want you to go on with Jesus. It, 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 we really do. That's the, that's the motivation. We want the kingdom to come in all our lives and to extend beyond here. And we want to reflect Jesus to the world. And when you come to know him better, and when we as a family come to know him better, then we will reflect him better to the world. Amen? By way of contrast, sadly, Paul weeps over those who give themselves to other things. Verse 18 and 19, he says, For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So here, he describes a self-centered, greedy, immoral, shameless people. He says, that root... If that's the route you go down, then where it leads is it leads to destruction. It's a bit like if I go down to Sussex, to the cliff edge, to Beachy Head, one of the high cliffs down on the south coast, and I'm walking towards the cliff. I've got a choice, haven't I? I can walk towards the cliff, and if I walk far enough, I'll plunge to my death. But if I don't, if I turn away from that, and I walk the other way, then I walk to safety. That's what he's saying here. He's saying if we reject Christ, if we walk away from him, we're like someone walking to beachy head, walking to the edge. We're just walking to destruction. Whereas if we walk towards Christ, if we accept him, if we receive him, then that's a totally different matter. We are now citizens of heaven when we do that. Paul threw himself into Christ's calling on his life, full of rejoicing. Not because he enjoyed suffering. He didn't enjoy the fact that he was getting lashed. He didn't enjoy the fact that he was being shipwrecked. He didn't enjoy that. But what he recognized was this, that as he suffered for the gospel, he was being identified with Christ. And the resurrection meant there would be a great reward as well, as Jesus promised. Blessed are you, he says, when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. So if you're suffering in any shape or form for the sake of the gospel, then Jesus says you're blessed. 
and there will be a great reward for you in heaven. Coming now towards the end of this part of the passage in verse 20 and verse 21, Paul says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So he's giving us a picture there of our destination. Now we have a lowly body. What does he mean by that? Well, our body weakens as we get older. We get tired. Our body longs for comfort. So we see that particularly when we make New Year resolutions. I'm going to go on a diet this year. I'm going to get fit this year. And how that resolution soon fades away. Why? Because the body wants comfort. Ah, you know, we get a little bit stressed, so we eat. Or, you know, we're tired, I don't want to go to, I don't want to exercise today. You know, we start off, but the body, our lowly body, but what's going to happen one day is our lowly body is going to be transformed into a glorious body that will have bags of energy, that will never get tired. Amazing. That's where we're heading, is what Paul is saying. And not only that, he says Christ is going to, con- he says, he enables him to bring everything under his control by his power. Enables him to bring everything under his control. So one day, what's going to happen is the whole creation is going to be liberated from its bondage to decay. All those things that drag society down, that drag civilization down, all those things are going to terminate. And God is going to renew the whole creation. That is where we are heading. So where And what are you giving your life to? Are you giving your life to something which is temporary? Or are you giving your life to something which is permanent? Do you know where you're heading? Are you heading over Beachy Head Cliff? Are you walking towards Jesus in whom there is new life and resurrection power? There is no end to God's love. There is no end to us getting to know him. So let's be like the Apostle Paul and press on to know him. Amen? Amen. Could I ask the band to come back up? Mark and the band. And uh, are we going to sing that song? Yeah, we're going to sing that song. Let's get it in our hearts and minds the reality of who God is. He is a good, good father. Amen? And we can confidently say, I am loved by him. Yes? Amen.